Testing one, two. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Praise the Lord, it's a great morning. It is. It's a little rainy outside, but the sun's inside. Our son, son of God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We have a nice service plan today. I'm so thankful to see everybody here. We're going to start off with some, uh, a couple of little duet songs here. And uh, it's called My Heart Sings Praises. So if we could stand together, let's go ahead and start. Here we go. Let's stand together. Thank you. 
for this opportunity to serve you today. Lord, I pray that you're exalted through this whole thing. And I pray that you open the hearts and ears and the eyes and the mind of everybody, Lord, that they would receive you. And I pray that you would just bless this service in a big way. And we thank you, Lord, for everything that you do. We ask for these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's one called, Oh, Lord God. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no 
chapter 16, verses 24 through 28. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 28. Praise the Lord, we're talking about David and Bathsheba today. The title of the sermon is basically The High Cost of Low Living, number two. We did that with Samson, and here we're doing it with David and Bathsheba. It's a real powerful one today. But today, can we have our ushers come forward? We're going to sing one last song, one more song. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Here we go. 
somebody and make them welcome. We're going to switch over for the message. And the children are excused to Children's Church. And we're in the service today. Okay, good. And so let's make somebody welcome. And we'll be starting in just one minute. Here we go. Better. 
sections I want you to be able to go to. We're going to be in 2 Samuel 11. But today I wanted to go ahead and go back and forth between 2 Samuel 11 and Psalm 38, which is one of David's psalms. We won't go back and forth quickly, but we will be in 2 Samuel 11 first, and then we'll go to Psalms, and then eventually they will get back to 2 Samuel again. You know, the Word of God convicts us, and when we fall astray, it seems like we can constantly have to come back to Him so we can get restored. It's so important. And that's just like David, you know. He did fall away, but he could always find his way back. It makes me think of a story. I love the little story about the little boy that was lost. And, and there was an officer in northern England, and his name was Officer O'Hanlon. And that's an Irish name, but it was he was in northern England. But this Officer Hanlon heard a cry. And it was a boy that was crying. And he looked over there, and, uh, and he said, uh, and he said, uh, What's the matter, son? He goes, I'm lost. And he says, you're lost. And he says, do you, know where, you don't know where you live? And he goes, I don't remember. And so the officer started naming some streets off, and he named a bunch of streets, and he just didn't recognize any of those streets. 
And the officer started naming some establishments and some bakeries and some other different stores. And he says, I don't know any of those stores. Well, the officer thought, man, he is really lost. And so he took the little boy up into his arms and then he pointed across town to the large cathedral that had a large wooden cross on the top of it. And he said, do you live anywhere near that? And he was all happy. He said, yes, take me to the cross and I can find my way home. I like that. That's like Sunday cross here, you know. Come to the cross and you'll be able to find your way home with the message. What a nice message that is. Well, today we're going to be in the high cost of low living with David and Bathsheba, but I think we're going to start off with a prayer. We're going to pray for a couple people. And so if we can bow our heads, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to pray. We thank you for the word that you've given today, too, Lord. And I pray that you would just hold these certain ones up. Michelle and Shannon are on a trip to Arizona, and they're going to be gone for two weeks. And so I pray that you would just protect them. Keep a hedge of protection around them and bless them really good, Lord. And just help them have a safe trip that way. And just, uh, you know, just let it go like they planned on. They had plans for when they got back there. And I just pray that things work out correctly for them. Also, Lord, we want to thank Denda, too, Lord, for doing some of the yard work out in front that was so nice and everything, and we still need a little bit more of it done, but, Lord, we just are thankful for the workers that we do have, and we're just so thankful for everything you do. Anyway, Lord, we are thankful for this word, and we just pray that you would just open it up and just make it alive today. Let the people receive a message that they could seal to their heart, Lord, and just help them to understand you so they might be able to grow and become more like you because that's our goal. That's your goal for us is to become more like you. We thank you again, Lord, for this opportunity to serve and for these wonderful words. We ask for all these things in your precious name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want you to find, first of all, 2 Samuel 11, and this is a very sad chapter in the Word of God. It's a tragic chapter. And here is the question, can a child of God sin? Yes. Can a child of God sin and not suffer? No. I want you to pay attention to this scripture too, and I love David, and David is a man that I look forward to meeting in heaven. The Bible calls David a man after God's own heart. And King David, the poet, the sweet singer of Israel, the mighty warrior, was one of the greatest men, in my estimation, that ever lived. Now, when I think of David, first of all, I think of his bravery. You remember how brave he was. The Bible records, you know, the stories about how he killed a lion and a bear. And then as a little lad, he went out after Goliath and killed Goliath. And we all know these stories, and we love David's bravery. And then we think of his talent. I mean, what a king, what an administrator, what a warrior, what a poet, what a musician. One of the most talented men who ever lived was this man, David, and yet he was so humble that after he was appointed and anointed to be the king of Israel, he went back to tending sheep. What a humble man this this David was anyway, and how noble he was also. Remember, Saul had tried to kill David, and David had uh, said that, uh, you know, he was opportunity to exterminate Saul. And many said that he ought to have done it and stuff, but David was so noble that he said, I will not lay a hand on God's anointed. And I'm telling you that David was a man among men, a man above every other man and stuff. And he was an incredible individual. And yet David fell into the deep, dark, hateful, heinous sin And this chapter tells us all about it. You know, when God paints a verbal portrait of a man, he doesn't hide the blemishes or the scars. And here is a scar on this life of this man named David right here. I want you to listen, but we're going to start reading right now in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. Now David did not go to war. And he was the great warrior king. But David is king, all right. But it's a time, it says, when kings went to war. There were certain periods when they all went to war. We never do it like that in World War II and everything, except for the monsoons in Vietnam. That war went on all the time. And we lost more people in the war from the cold than we did from the battle. 
But the thing is, is that there was a time when people went to war, and this was not This was it, finally. They did not go to war at this time. He was the warrior king. And it was a time when kings went to war, and David was a king, and yet he tarried there still in Jerusalem. I'm going to read the rest of it, verses 2 through 5. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And people walked on the roofs in their house. That's where their porch was. They got on the roof and walked around. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him, and he lay with her. Or she was purified from her unscleanliness. That means after they were done, they made sure they did their purification rites, because they didn't want to do the wrong thing, you know after committing adultery and all. And she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. So David has committed the sin of adultery and the woman conceived and now David is in perplexity. You say, well, pastor, what's it got to do with me? Well, I want to tell you, it has something to do with every one of us. And we need to take warning from this message because none of us are better than David was. None of us are more noble, more gifted, or more humble than David. David fell into sin, and you can too. Now, there are three things or points that I want you to see, as I'm going to call, on your outline, the tragic cause of David's sin. So how can a man like this fall into sin? I mean, a good man like this. Well, let me tell you what his sin was. First of all, it was the sin of idleness. I want you to read one and two one more time. And it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah but David tarried still in Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked onto the roof of the king's house and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. So first of all, the Bible says it was a time when kings went to war, and then David is still there in Jerusalem. Now the Bible says that the harvest was over, because that's what it means when it says the year has expired. That means the harvest is over, okay? Now the battle has begun. There's one thing I want to tell you too. There are two fields that every one of us should always be in, and we need to stay in. One is the harvest field, and the other is the battlefield. And I mean, if you're a man of God or a woman of God or a child of God, on your outline, God never intends for you to ever get out of the harvest field or the battlefield on your outline. If you're not in the harvest field, you should be in the battlefield. If you're not in the battlefield, you should be in the harvest field. Now, here's the problem. David is not doing something wrong at this particular time, except that he's failing to do something right. So David's sin here is the sin of omission. Now we've talked about omission many times. You know, the things you don't do that you should do are the sins of omission. Not the things that you outwardly do wrong. But the sin of omission is, let's say, you don't go to church. Well, is that a sin? Yes, yeah, a sin of omission. Something you didn't do. But sins of omission is what he had here. And his first sin on your outline is the sin of idleness. Idleness. The Bible says that to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And I'm going to tell you something, folks, that every sin ultimately is a sin of omission. Every sin. And it's because if you are doing what you ought to do, you cannot be doing what you ought not to do. Is that not true? And so David should have been with his compatriots at war, but he was not. Well, what was he doing? He was in bed. What was he doing in bed? Well, listen to this. It was in the afternoon. The Bible says in the evening tide, or the eventide. That is when the sun is setting, and David is arising from the bed. So he's in bed, blowing around. Now he gets up and goes out and walks, and he looks around out on the roof of his house. Now, there is a time for legitimate rest, but you're not supposed to stay in the sack all day and all day long. That's not good. Let me read what it says in Proverbs 24, 33, and 34. It says this. 33 and 34, Donald put it up, there we go. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. 
listen, you don't want to be sitting around the house all day watching TV and stuff and laying around and sleeping. If you have nothing else to do, you should be getting out and raking a yard or doing something like that. And for all the men that say they don't have a job to do, well, I want to tell you, if you say you don't have work, what you can do, you can, you can go serve somebody even if they don't, get, don't pay you. That's how you can get a job. And by the way, if you want a job, just go get a job that way. You just go to the place where you want to work and you just hang out there and you say you want to work so bad and stay there and work. He says, I'm not hiring anybody. You say, well, fine. So it would be all right if I came and worked for you for nothing. Yeah, and he said, well, pretty soon, uh, you're not doing anything anyway, so you could do that. But rather than sitting around and watching TV and things like that, now listen, you say that you will work for him for absolutely nothing. I'll tell you, he'll look like you're crazy. I mean it, but in time, you will have a job right there with that man because you want it that bad. That's how I've got all my jobs in the music ministry or in church or anything like that. I don't want to work. I don't want to work. I didn't have anything to do with the money. I knew I needed money. But when you go to work, you go to work. And if you mean something to the boss, I mean, and you really mean business, he's going to hire you. You will become valuable. I always tried to make my job so important that if they didn't have it, they would miss me. <laughs> and so that's one of my philosophies. Well, you, sir, are headed for trouble if you are not going to work and you're just going to lay around. Now, if you're retired or something, it just means that you have more time to serve God. Isn't that right? Huh. You're not supposed to be sitting around like a dollar doing nothing. God wants you to be occupied because the Lord Jesus said, we are to occupy until he comes. Well, where was David's sin then? What was it? Well, he had the sin of idleness. But number two on your outline, it was also the sin of carelessness. Carelessness. David was a warrior king, and now he has taken off his armor. And what does the Bible tell us to do? The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 2, 3, endure hardness as a good soldier for Jesus Christ. Well, why had David take his armor off? I mean, there was a battle going on. Why did he take his armor off? Well, here's why. David had had so many victories. He now begins to take his victories for granted. He's got a big, tough Joab and all the people behind him. And he just presumes that God is just going to keep on blessing. Now, I'm talking to some of you who might have been mighty warriors for the Lord, and now you seem to be, or maybe, maybe getting careless. And you think that you're so strong, don't you? And you think that you can't fall. And really, you think that you won't fall, isn't that right? And you've got a great record behind you, but listen, David had a great record behind him, too. And let me tell you where David fell. On your outline, David did not fall because he was weak. David fell because he was strong. Strong on your outline. David fell not at the point of his weakness, but David fell at the point of his strength. And where was David's strength? It was his, on your outline, his integrity. Integrity. He said, in the Psalms, I walked in my integrity. He was a judge. And if there was a man who had integrity, it was David. Yet David fell at the point of his integrity. And I'll tell you why he fell at the point of his integrity. It was because he got careless. And he was idle. And then he was more careless. Listen to me, folks. I want to tell you something that an unguarded strength, on your outline, an unguarded strength is a double weakness. An unguarded strength is a double weakness. I mean, if you study the great men of God and find out if they failed, where they failed, and you're going to find out that they failed at the point of their strength, not their weakness. You know, it's always surprising when people do jobs and they're not that good at it. And they're so worried about doing it. I'm less worried about that because the Lord has a way of blessing the weak. When you think you can do it, you might not be able to. You need the Lord for everything. And sometimes he takes the weak things to confound the, the wise and the strong. But if you study the great men of God, you'll see that they failed in their strength, not their weakness. Like what was Simon Peter's greatest strength? His courage. He said, oh Lord, I'll go to prison for you or unto death. He was the one that pulled out the sword and he went after the man in the garden of Gethsemane and stuff. You remember that? And I'll tell you, you wouldn't want to get in a fist fight with Peter. He was tough. He was a big fisherman. And yet where did he fail? At the point of his courage, a little girl caused him to curse and deny the Lord Jesus. Matthew 26, 74. Listen, here was a man who failed because of his carelessness. And that's the reason that the Bible says, keep your heart with all diligence. Don't get idle and don't get careless. Now, I'll tell you what. Not only was it the sin of idleness and not only was it the sin of carelessness. Number three on your outline, it was the sin of impulsiveness. I mean, David did not plan the sin that day. 
He had no idea that he would have done such a horrible thing then. I mean, it was not in his plans. He was not planning it. He was not scheming it. He's walking on the rooftop, and everybody's porch was on the rooftop, and he looks over there, and there she was. And the Bible says that he saw her, and the fire of lust began to burn in him. And this was his impulsive. He was impulsively, he thought, and his impulsiveness caused him to sin. He had no idea that he would have done such a thing. Are you listening to me? And sin is a combination of three things. On your outline, it is an undetected weakness. It is an unexpected opportunity compounded by an unprotected life. That is the reason that you must keep your heart and protect your life. You do not know what is latent in your old flesh. And you say, well, I've been saved for a long time. My flesh has really improved. Listen, your flesh has not improved one scintilla of an iota at all. It only takes one minute to make that flesh stumble. That is which is flesh is flesh. And that is the reason that you must do what the Lord Jesus Christ taught us to do when we pray every day and say, Dear God, lead us, lest we fall into temptation and deliver us from evil. And you bring that mantle of God protection over your life because if there is an unprotected weakness and an unexpected opportunity and an unprotected life, you may go down. Listen, he was impulsive in his sin and he did not intend to do this thing. Now, I'm telling you right now, there are three people sitting in your chair right now. And you say, gee, I wondered why it was so crowded. No, but there's three people. There is the person that you are right now at this moment there is the person that you could be for God if you sold out about for 100%, 100% and really most of us are light years from what we could be or ought to be. And then there's the person for evil that we might be if we take our eyes off the Lord. If we take our eyes off the Lord. Now, I tell you that David never dreamed that he would do such a thing. Never, never. I mean, if you would have asked David if he would have done something like this, he would have said never. He would have never done that. But he did. And it was an impulsive sin because he had gotten to coast. He had begun to coast and his heart had gotten cold. And he didn't even realize how cold his heart was. And this happens to us sometimes. We're going along and we think we're doing okay. But really we're becoming insensitive and we're becoming colder. And you know we say when somebody says, says something terrible like this, we go, man, wow, he really fell and everything. But the problem is, is that we didn't really know how low they were living. It appeared outwardly that everything looked fine. But his heart was getting cold. And now I'm telling you what else it was on your outline. It became number four, the sin of callousness. Callousness. You're going to find out that when David discovered that Bathsheba was pregnant, he tried to cover it up. He says, ah, oh, I know what I'll do. I'm going to bring your husband back home from the battlefield and they'll spend the night together, and he'll think it's his child. Well, he brought Uriah home from the battlefield, but Uriah loved David so much that he was loyal to his soldiers on the battlefield. He says, I can't go have romance with my wife. I am too loyal to them. It's just not right. When my fellow soldiers are all out there in the battlefield, and so rather than going home, he slept outside the David's door just to protect David his king. David realized that the plan wasn't going to work. And you know, one sin leads to another. And so he said, I've got to do something. I've got to get rid of Uriah. Because Uriah is going to know that this is not Uriah's child. So David calls his big commander, Joab. He calls him in. He says, take Uriah and put him out there into the battle and right out there in the forefront of the battle. And then when he gets out there in the forefront of the battle, I want you to withdraw all the troops and Uriah will be out there and he'll be killed. Ooh. And then we can tell everybody that he was just killed in the battle. I tell you, it was a diabolical plan that was hatched in hell. How could David do something like that? And here is Uriah, David's friend. He was with him, one of the mighty men. And he is going to die now by David's hand. On your outline, David's sin with Bathsheba was a hot-blooded sin. He saw her and he lusted after her. But David's sin with Uriah was a cold-blooded sin. He planned it. He connived it. It was one of the dirtiest deeds ever done. Uriah the high tech who would have died for David's honor, now died by David's hand. 
how could David be doing this? I mean, is this David really? Is this the one who wrote the Psalms? Do you know a verse comes to mind when I think about all this? I'll tell you what it is. Hebrews 3.13, beware lest any of you on your outline be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We've heard that. Here's a man whose heart now becomes hard. David could have never imagined that he would have possibly done this, much less commit the sin of adultery. But he did. The sin of idleness and the sin of carelessness and impulsiveness and callousness. Now, number five, stubborn. It's like scent delusion. We hear about people being scent delusion. I had a hard time understanding that for a long time, but I understand it real well anymore. <coughs> God has spoken to David, and David was under great conviction, but David went one whole year without that Holy Spirit, without repenting, without getting right with God. How stubborn David was. And some of you are in that place right now. It's not only cold, but you've rationalized your thing. You've rationalized your coldness and basically you're stonewalling God. And you're thinking that you are going to somehow make all these things work out anyway or somehow God is going to forget about the things that you did. And somehow you think that the statute of limitations is going to run out. And somehow you think that you're going to muddle through and gloss this thing all over and you stubbornly go on day after day, day after day, thinking maybe God's forgotten. And you know what happens to David? David continued to be a king and he continued to wear that smile and he put on that front even with all of his guilt. That's all he did. And he had that guilt and he had to judge people and there were people in that place that knew about his sin. How can you judge and be righteous when they know what you're really like? But that was the sin and that caused David's sin. Now I want you to listen to the second thing or the second point. I want you to notice not only the tragic cause of it, but I want you to notice, secondly on your outline, the tremendous cost of it. Listen to the last words that are spoken in 2 Samuel 12, 27, 11, 27, excuse me. 11, 27, it says, And when the morning was passed, of course, that's Bathsheba's morning for seven days, David sent and fed her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. David knew on your outline that it displeased God. Now, keep your place. I want you to think about something. We're going to move to Psalm 38. And here's Psalm 38. We're going to see the tremendous cost of David's sin as he's writing about this sin. And I said in the beginning, can a child of God sin? Yes. Can a child of God sin and not suffer? Absolutely not. Now remember that the Bible said that this thing displeased the Lord. Well, look how David speaks about this displeasure because he knew it displeased the Lord. Let's start with chapter 38, verses 1 and 2. Oh Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. Well, what has happened when a child of God sins? Well, we're going to see, first of all, in verse 1, as we look at it, it says, Rebuke me not in thy wrath. So the first thing I want you to put on your outline there are the words of rebuke. First of all, you will be rebuked. You will be confronted about your thing that you did. And I've had that seen that so many times that somebody will just come up and just tell you about, well, you shouldn't be doing this sin and this, and not even knowing that they're talking about you. But God will do that. And God, the Holy Spirit, will speak to you and God will rebuke you when you sin and God will put His finger on that sore spot and say, that was wrong. Now listen, if you're living in sin, high, wide, and handsome, maybe it's the sin of adultery or homosexuality or maybe some other kind of sin and God does not rebuke you and there is no conviction, I wouldn't give a half of a hallelujah for your hope of heaven. Listen to me. If you're a child of God, God will rebuke you. I mean, you can do whatever you want to do anyway, but you're going to end up with a lot of disappointment and from the consequences and from the guilt. Now, there are words of rebuke. And then secondly on your outline, there were the arrows of conviction. Look what it says in verse 2 in Psalm 38. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. For thine arrows stick in me. 
You see, God pierced his heart. And God said, David, what you've done is wrong. And it was horribly wrong. And then also notice he said in verse 2, Thy hand presseth me sore. Thy hand presseth me sore. So words of rebuke first, then arrows of conviction. Now, thirdly on your outline, the hand of pressure. Pressure will come down on you. And sometimes people have the idea, oh, well, if we sin, God just tosses us away and stuff, and then he won't have anything to do with us then. But that's not right at all. We believe in eternal security. We believe that once you're born again, you're born again. And you have to live like that. If you don't, God will take you home. God doesn't chase you away if you're a child of his. When you sin, God puts his hand on you and squeezes. And David says, your hand was heavy on me. That's like in Psalm 51 where he spoke of his bones being broken. And they weren't broken, but he was talking about the stress and the pain that he was going through. You see, he's a poet, and he's speaking poetically, and he says, God, you're crushing me. God, you're squeezing the life out of me. Well, let me ask you, do you know that kind of pressure? Have you ever felt it? If you're living in that in sin, you know that kind of pressure, you better thank God for it because if you're chest and you're one of his. And if God's words of rebuke and if God has arrows of conviction and if God has a hand of pressure on you, say thank you. He loves me too much to let me get away with this. And so here's David. He's under conviction. And ultimately, this is a mark that a person is saved. The Bible says if we be without chastisement, then we are, on your outline, illegitimate. If we are without chastisement, we are illegitimate. That means we never got saved. Learn this. And I've said it before, the most miserable man in the world is not an unsaved man. The most miserable man in the world is a child of God that is out of fellowship with God. Is that not right? There's nowhere to go when you're out of fellowship with God. You've got to find, it, find your way back. Like Peter said, where else will we go? That's exactly right. And once you're saved, he is the only way to go. And for David, he was the only way to go, even though he had to pay for all of this the rest of his life. Now, there are more miserable people that are, unsaved, that are saved people out of fellowship than the unsaved man. The unsaved men can live in, their, in their, the way they want to and enjoy it easier. But you know, other men in the kingdom could have, not, could have done these things that David did, and they would have never felt bad about it. What David did, they did all the time, other kings. But when God saves you, he doesn't fix you up where you can't sin anymore, but mister, he fixes you up where you can't sin and enjoy it. If you're saved... And there are words of wrath, and there are arrows of conviction, and there is a hand of pressure. And listen, have you ever been out so many and wouldn't sing and you talk to a guy, and you just can tell that he's not about to let you talk to him. And when you talk to him about being saved, you go, oh, I was saved when I was a kid. I, back I came down to your church, I got saved down there when I was a teenager, before I was a teenager down there and stuff. But, but he's not living for God, and he's living in sin, and he doesn't care about the things of God. I want to tell you, he's going to split hell wide open because he hasn't been saved. He said, oh, I'm an old backslider. You've heard people say that. I'm telling you right now, he, if he was a backslider, he couldn't laugh about his situation. He would be worried and sick about it. No, he's not a backslider. If he was a backslider, he couldn't laugh about it. And I'm telling you that he's never been saved. He didn't lose his salvation. He never had it. If you're a child of God and you're living in sin, he's not going to let you go. And you're not going to be able to get away with it. Let me show you what David's sin did. Look at verse 3 on your outline. Number one, his sin wearied him. It wearied him. Look at verse 3. There's no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. That means night and day and day and night. The thing that David has done in his heart and in his mind, he just can't sleep. And I tell you, a clear conscience is much better than a sleeping pill. <coughs> An unresolved guilt will zap the strength out of your life and strength that you ought to be given to productive purposes. And his sin wearied him. It wearied him on his decision making and everything. Notice in verse 4, number 2, his sin weighted him on your outline. Weighted him. Look what it says in verse 4. For my iniquities are gone over mine head as a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. 
I always think about this story about the pastor that went down to Mexico and he had rented this car from this Mexican who was going to drive him around. And so this Mexican was driving him around, pretty soon they stopped because this pastor had the joy of leading this Mexican to Christ. Well, after they prayed in that little Volkswagen, they were there in and stuff. And the, he said to the pastor, the Mexican, he said, Pastor, let me tell you how it feels. It feels like I've been carrying a great big bag of stones all my life and I just set them down. What a thing. It sounds like he really was born again. And that's like David's sin. It was a weight. And his sin weighed him. His sin weighted him. His sin wearied him. And number three, his sin wounded him on your outline. Look at verse five. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. Now, I think he's talking about the corruption on the inside. And we're talking about what happened when the arrow went in him. That arrow that was sticking into him was the arrow of conviction. And we're talking poetically here, but I want to tell you something. You see, sorrow on your outline is a clean wound. It will heal. Sorrow is a clean wound. It'll heal. But guilt is a dirty wound. It only festers until it is cleansed. Guilt is different than sorrow. No, not only did his sin weary him and weighted him and wound him, but number four, on your outline, it worried him. Look at verse six, what it says here. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. What a miserable man. He's worried about his sin. And I mean, if they would have telephones in that day, every time that telephone rang, he would have jumped. And every time he saw people talking, he'd be wondering, are they talking about me? You know, when he was confronted with Nathaniel and they told him what his sin was, there were people that were listening. And do you know, is the word out he keeps thinking? He has no peace. The poem, trust me, no torture to poet's name, can match that fear's unutterable pain. He that feels who day and night devoid of rest carries his own accuser within his breast. Number five on your outline, his sin wasted him. Look at verse 7. For my loins are filled with a loathsome disease, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I believe that David had a venereal disease, and that's what he's talking about. Now he's talking about a loathsome de disease. Now he's talking politically now. He had a few moments of pleasure, and sin promised much, but it pays little, and his sin now has wasted him. He's wasted him, and now he's just alone there. And he's just having the hardest time of his life being of old age. Don't be worried about having safe sex. You put your attention on sacred sex because that's always safe. Yeah. God's plan for you is one man and one woman. Clean, marital, chastity, pope, marital fidelity. But with David, his sin wasted him. His sin has wasted him. What a wasted life this was. God told him not to have all those wives, but he had them. He said, don't multiply wives and horses, but he did. And his life has wasted him, and that's not all, because on number six on your outline, his sin weakened him. Look at verse eight. I am feeble, it says here. I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. He used to be the mighty warrior. He used to, now he's broken up the body, and he's broken in spirit too. And sin promises much, but it pays so well. Let me show you how weak he was. In the next verse, it speaks of himself being blind and deaf and dumb. Listen, he says this in verse 10. Look what it says. My heart panteth, my strength faileth me. As for the light of mine eyes, it also is gone from me. You see, he used to be that mighty warrior. For the light of mine eyes, he says now, is also gone out from me. The light of mine eyes. He was so sad. For the bunch of years, David's life. Look what it says in verse 13. It says, But as a deaf man heard not, and I was as dumb man that opened not his mouth. So here we have this mighty warrior of Israel, spiritually blind, spiritually deaf, spiritually dumb, and he's blind to blessing and deaf to danger. And no longer is he speaking and singing and praising and worshiping the Lord God. His sin has weakened him, this mighty man of God. And this is the loss for David. And I don't even have time to talk about the cost of his friends and everything, but let's read verse 11 to just touch it. And it says here, My lovers and my friends stand aloof from my sore. 
And my kinsmen stand afar off. Kids would throw things at him. He couldn't do anything. His hardest trial was to get Solomon elected king. This is later on in the story, but there he is, and he's like wore out, and he's got disease. And we see that, you know, there's David. And you know what the sore means right there? It's speaking poetically, and it's speaking of leprosy. He didn't have leprosy, but he became a moral leper because he feels so unclean. And his friends and his acquaintances and his kinfolks, they're backing away from him now. What a tragedy that David's sin was that brought to his family. I'd rather die in, by torture than dishonor God like that and dishonor the family. Oh, the high cost of low living for just a few moments of pleasure. So see, we have the tragic cause and we have the tremendous cause. Now I want you to see on your outline, if you will, thirdly, the timely challenge to David's sin. Do you think that God's going to just let this go on and on and on? No, no, no. Let's go back to 2 Samuel 11 and you're going to find that God sent somebody to speak to David about his sin. There's that confrontation, look if you will, when Nathan speaks to him. Look what it says in 2 Samuel 12, verse 9. It says this, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord? He says he despises the commandments of the Lord because he did this thing. Nathan told David, and you do evil in his sight. Thou hast killed Uriah the high type with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Adam. And so we see, now let me, let me tell you how God deals with this man though here. When he's in this kind of a sin, and he does this with others too when they're in this type of a sin. First of all, on your outline, there is a first of all a conviction. You get a conviction. Those words of rebuke, that arrow of conviction, that hand of pressure. And so now what should you do if there is sin in your life? Really, maybe just the sin of coldness. Because that's where it all starts. And it may be just a very small sin, not a big sin. But listen, you've got to deal with it immediately. You have to deal with it right now. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, 31 and 32, and if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. You see, God is not trying to get even with you. God just wants you to be corrected. In verse 32, it says, and when we're judged, we're chastised or chastened of the Lord. And so we should not be condemned with the world. We are born again. We get chastised of the Lord. And it's also, we won't be chastised with the world. God's judgment is coming on this world and we belong to Jesus. When we're judged, we're chastised of the Lord. And so we won't be condemned with the world. You know, when parents punish their children, they're not trying to get even with their kids. They're just trying to correct their kids. And there are some children that all you have to do is just look at them and their little hearts will melt. But if the child has repented and the child has changed, they're no longer doing the problem what they were doing. Don't say, well, I'm going to punish them anyway. No, no. What you want to do is a change of behavior. And that's all you want for them to change. That's what repentance is, a change of behavior. And if you would judge ourselves, if we would judge ourselves, we will not be judged. God's not trying to get even with his child. God wants to correct that child. So first of all, there's conviction. But suppose the conviction don't work. What if it doesn't work? Well, then there's the second step on your outline. There is then chastisement. He will do something. And God will carry you to the woodshed. Look what it says in Hebrews 12, 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. So don't think that God won't chastise you. Let me tell you something. God is more concerned on your outline with your holiness than he is about your health. He cares more about your character and your personality and your holiness than he does about your health. God is more concerned about your righteousness than he is about you driving a Cadillac or living in a big house or having business success. So we have the conviction. And after the conviction, there's the chastisement. And after the chastisement, thirdly on your outline, there is confrontation. There will be a confrontation. He will bring you to one. And God will not let it you go on. That's why God sent Nathan the prophet to confront him. It's just too bad it took him a whole year. But that's how much chances that God gives him to repent and come back to the Lord. But no, he didn't do it. And so he had to send Nathan. What about you? Does he have to send somebody for you? Or will you judge yourself? 
Now, I don't know how the confrontation may be to you. I don't know how, what it might come from. It might be some book you read or something. Maybe the Holy Spirit will just speak to your heart. I don't know, maybe it'll be your wife or maybe it'll be your husband or your pastor or your friend. Maybe it'll be some kind of circumstances, but you'll know when you're right on the threshold of being judged. You never know, it might even be this sermon. Now, I don't know why God wanted me to preach this sermon today. I was going to preach it on the third service, but for some reason, he wanted me to preach it today, and so I did. But I felt that it was laid on my heart that I needed to preach this today. And it seemed to me that God was saying, Daniel, there's somebody that needs to hear what I have to say. And I believe that there is a divine appointment here. So there is this confrontation. And number four on your bulletin, or your outline, the challenge, fourthly. Fourthly, the challenge. Suppose the challenge is not taken. Suppose that God says, all right, I've tried conviction. I've tried chastisement. I've tried the challenge. I've tried confrontation. Well, look, if you will, in 2 Samuel 12, 13, it says, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Well, thank God that he came to that place. You see, David was a great sinner, sinner but he became a great repenter. I want to show you something, though, here. I want you to look at chapter 12, verse 13, when it says this. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Do you know what was going to happen? You know what was going to happen? God was getting ready to kill David. Let me say that again. God was getting ready to kill David. You say, God wouldn't do that. Is that wrong? You better reread your Bible. He will. You better reread 1 John 5 where the Bible says in verse 16, on your outline, there's a sin unto death. There is. How did Moses die? Do you think Moses died of poor health? Moses went up on Mount Nebo and the Bible says that the eye was not dimmed, nor was his strength abated. And he walked to his own funeral, all because of his sin against God. That's how Moses died. And there's a sin unto death. You remember the man named Balaam? who was out of the will of God riding the donkey that day, and that donkey went out of that field, and he beat that donkey, and then he was going through a narrow place, and he crushed Balaam's leg against the wall, and then he got off of that donkey and began to beat that donkey again, and the Lord said, Hey, you're going against me. And Balaam saw the angel of the Lord. Who's the angel of the Lord? The pre incarnate Christ, of course, with a drawn sword. And the donkey had already seen the angel when the angel said to Balaam, had you gone any further, I would have surely killed you. Well, I'm not talking about the unsaved. Now we're talking about a child of God. This is when he was with, uh, working with God. And so Balaam did fall away. Of course, in the Old Testament, we see signs of the Holy Spirit being on the people that are anointed. And when they sin, the Holy Spirit leaves them. This is full of the Old Testament. Balaam was with God. He was God's prophet. And this was happening when he was going to go somewhere and God didn't want him to and he started to be out of the will of God. But it's likewise, Nathan said to David, David, thank God you confessed your sin so now you're not going to die. Wow. So there was a man, I remembered a story I was told about a guy who went to church and a man was led by Christ and he was like a brother to the pastor. They were so close and it was such a... But for some reason, this man, this leader in the church, has got some silly little sin in his heart. I didn't want to bring it up. And it dealt primarily with pride. Well, the pastor confronted him and said, Hey, Jack, you're a good man. Don't let that be in your heart and your life. You have to get right with God. You have to get right with God. And Jack said, Well, I'm not going to do it this time. And the pastor said, Well, no, don't wait a minute. You just say that you need help or something. Don't say that you're not going to do it. And Jack said, I don't care. I don't, I don't care. I'm not going to do it. And the pastor said, but Jack, the Bible says, keep back thy servant from presumptuous sin. And Jack said, I don't care what the Bible says. And the pastor said, now wait a minute, Jack. When you do that, you challenge God, and that's arrogance. We've talked many times about mocking God. I've had many stories about mocking God and what happens to them. And this bold and blatant sin against God, he said. God is going to judge you, Jack. And do you know what Jack said? He said, he can do with me what he wants and stuff. I'm tired of it. I'm not going to change. And the pastor felt a cold chill come over him. And he said, Jack, take it back. He said, well, I've said it. The pastor said, Jack, take it back. He says, I'm not going to do it. And the pastor just was amazed. He couldn't believe his ears. He's been going to church all this time. And he turned his back on God. And he knew he was saved. 
And he said, well, Jack, I'm afraid for you. Well, the pastor went and told a friend, he said, I'm putting you on notice. I want you to watch this whole thing. He says, I want you to bear witness. You watch, and I want you to see what's about to happen. Well, the pastor was out of town the next week, and he got a phone call, and the person was, he said, Pastor, did you hear about Jack? And he said, no, Jack fell dead. In just a few days, Jack died. And he fell dead with no reason for him to fall dead. This is a true story. And he fell dead with no reason for him to fall dead. And the pastor said, but I'm not surprised, but I'm so saddened for it. Listen to me, folks. If you step out of the will of God, if you're truly born again, you better watch out. And you better be thankful when you are chastened, because that means that God does love you, and he wants to bring you back to the fold and make you right with God. He wants to put you into fellowship so you will have the joy that comes from knowing him. And the Bible says that there is a sin unto death. Now, I want you to think about it like this. Let's say you had a little child, and you took that child to a birthday party. And that child is smearing the cake and pulling the hair of the little girls, and he's ripping the presents. And you're his mom, and the first thing you want to do is correct him. And you speak to him, and that doesn't, if he doesn't listen, then you take him out and you spank him. And if he gets worse, what do you do? You say, we're going home. I'm going to take you home. It works the same way. If you're a child of God that gets into sin, does that mean he's, you're not going to go to heaven? No. But it may mean you're going to get there a lot sooner. You know, an out-of-fellowship Christian, a poor, lukewarm Christian is worse for the church than the unsaved world. The unsaved world doesn't know about God like you do, but when you say you're a Christian and you live like a heathen, you're a disgrace. You're a disgrace. And we're going home. I'm taking you home. They'll say, and if that child gets into sin, he, you know, you're gonna, he's going to take you home. It may be that he'll get there a lot quicker. It's just like when Moses went, he's in heaven, and Moses went up to Mount Nebo, and his eye was not dim, and his strength was not debated. And Balaam would have gone any farther. God would have killed him. And David would have not been repented. God would have killed him. And I want to tell you, if you're living in sin, God is not going, and God is not dealing with you. Do you know what you need to do? You need to get right with God. You need to be born again. Because the wrath of God is on all of the unsaved. And if you want to get that wrath of God off of you, you better become born again. And if you're born again, you need to learn to live the life. You see, God is serious about your life. On your outline, He wants you to live a righteous and holy life. Well, you say, Pastor, that's good, but... Boy, I hope they heard this message. But I'm talking to everyone. I'm talking to you. And you say, well, not me. I don't commit adultery. I don't commit murder. But that wasn't David's problem, what we're talking about. David's problem on your outline was the coldness of his heart. That's where it starts. That's where it began. He became lukewarm. You know, you have to renew your love with the Lord every day. You need to love him every day. It's like people say that I'm married, but I haven't seen my wife for 30 years. You're not married. <laughs> well, we're dealing with you now. And David may have met, been at the point that you're at right now in his heart that got cold. He just got complacent. He just got so, he wasn't thinking about the things of God. He was just thinking about the world and thinking about things to make him happy. But don't forget that he was the mighty warrior, the one who loved God with all of his heart, but now he puts his armor on. And now he's idle. Now he's lazy. Now he's no longer looking for God. And God is calling some of you today to renew your vows to Jesus. He wants you to get right with Him and start again afresh. And there are some that need, need to do that. So just tell God, God, I haven't committed adultery. Maybe I haven't committed murder. But anymore, maybe I don't seem to love you as much as I used to. Maybe I want to love you more, Lord. I've been lazy. I've been idle, and I've had an unguarded strength, and maybe, maybe it's a double weakness. So please restore me, Lord. And you know something? He will. He will. Because He is an awesome, awesome God. Amen. Don't ever, ever forget, though, that when you stray away from God, that there is a high cost to low living. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we just thank you for the instruction that you give us, teaching us, Lord. Help us make, it more, make us more like you. 
predestination is us becoming more like you. Lord, I pray that you would just strengthen us in our walk. Help us to seek you for all things. Help us to count our blessings. And help us to realize that all good things come from you. Help us to recognize that you are the most important thing there is. More important than everything. And when we put you first, all the other things fall in place. Because, Lord, we understand you want us to be happy. You want us to have the joy that comes from knowing you. But you want us to have the joy for the things that is our desire. Lord, help us to make our will your will. Help us teach us that we don't pray for things that are out of your will. But Lord, we just thank you again for hearing our prayer today. We turn our lives over to you again, like right now. And we thank you and ask for these things. In your precious name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, we got one last song. It sounded like my battery's going out with that volume going up and down like that. But if we could stand together, we'll sing, I sing praises to your name. And then I will release you. Here we go. <clears throat> the lives of these people and put a boldness in their heart that they would share you with other people. Help them to share the good news with other people, Lord. We found in Matthew, I mean in Malachi 3.16, it talks about the book of remembrance for those who love to talk about the Lord. Oh, we love to talk about him. Lord, just bless these people today. Make them strong and help them to know that all good things come from you. Help them to have a spring in their step and joy in their heart from the fellowship they have because they're right with you. So, Lord, I pray that you just touch them and bless them real good, Lord. And we thank you again. And we ask for all of these things in your precious name we pray. In Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. 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 Go with God. Thank you all for being here. Share the Lord with somebody else. Thank you.